behalf of the University of California, thank you for tuning in today for the February edition of the UC Alumni Career Network. My name is Fernando Pena and I serve as the Director of Recruitment at Claremont Graduate University, where I oversee recruitment and admissions for the Drucker School of Management. I am a proud UC Santa Barbara alumnus, so shout out to all of my gauchos that are joining us today. And I am honored to be moderating today's event focused on continuing education, graduate school certificate and online programs. Um, this program is a part of a UC wide effort to unite and support alumni across our 10 campuses. We aim to equip you with the information, the insights um, and connections necessary to launch, grow or expand your career. Throughout today's session, you will have the opportunity to ask questions of our speakers by clicking the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen or by emailing alumni at ucop.edu. We will try and answer as many questions as possible during the event. Our discussion today will focus on determining whether continuing your education is the right next step to advance your career. So during our session, we'll cover questions um, you, you should ask yourself to determine whether or not going back to school is the right next step, a quick overview of the graduate, uh, uh, a quick overview of the graduate school admissions process, and the role online certificate and continuing education programs um, can play in advancing your career. I am actually pleased to be joined by two inspiring UC alumni. Uh, Gina Reed is the strategic marketing manager for UC Davis's continuing and professional education division and a UC Davis alumni. So welcome, Gina. Dr. G uh, Gabriela Monsalve is the Assistant Dean for post uh, Postdoctoral Scholars and, adju and an Adjunct Assistant Professor at UC San Francisco. Gabby holds a PhD in Biological Chemistry from UCLA as well. So Gina and Gabby, thank you so much for being part of today's discussion, and I'm excited to go into this and, and dive deep, deeper into this topic with you too. Now, before diving into our panel discussion, we thought it would be helpful to begin today's webinar with a few general tips and questions you should ask yourself in order to determine whether returning to school is the right career move for you. So I will begin our session with a few insights from my role as a graduate admissions professional. Um, and um, I think will kind of lead us in the right direction and hopefully allow all of you uh, viewing us today um, to start thinking about the questions that, that you want to ask us. Um, give me one second. And I think this will kind of set us up for our discussion um, for as, as we move along. Um, but I, I do want to kind of share my experience with you all today. Um, I myself started uh, my admissions experience immediately after graduating from UCSB. So I graduated in 2010 and I became an admissions counselor right after that. And I was really fortunate to be able to do that and really launched my career into admissions and, and, and higher ed. Um, shortly after that, I, I went out to, I decided that I really need, in order to continue my career, I wanted to pursue higher education. Um, and I went to USC for my master's in education and was also at the same time working as senior assistant director of admissions. So both at the undergraduate and the graduate admissions role. And um, I was there for about six years and then I became director of admissions and enrollment management at the UCLA uh, School of Theater, Film, and Television, which I also managed undergraduate and graduate admissions functions. And today I'm Director of Recruitment at Claremont Graduate University, which is a graduate only and one of the few graduate only institutions in the country. So I've been right uh, all around um, the admissions experience gamut and um, I work with faculty committees, professional programs, academic programs, um, and we'll dive uh, deeper into what all of that means. Um, but one of the, the, the topics and questions that we really want to ask ourselves is, is there a right time for graduate school? And I think, you know, as you go along your career um, and your, your decision making, you know, there's a lot of things that we have to consider. I myself, as soon as I graduated, I realized my undergrad that I wanted to um, work a little and, and gain some experience. So I worked for about a year and a half before I realized that um, I, I, wa I wanted to go into higher ed and I wanted to move higher in the totem pole and then become a manager and become a director of admission one day. So for me, the decision was rather easy to want to go into higher education and want to go into a master's program um, and rather quickly, right? Because I was young and I was eager and I wanted to become a director right away and I wanted to do all of that. Um, you know, but long-term versus short-term career goals are, are something that we should obviously consider when we're thinking about, you know, is there a right time for graduate school? You know, a current situation 
is it feasible for me, right? Is this something that, you know, I can do now at this point in my life? Um, you know, that's something that we all obviously have to consider as, as we move on. And is this, you know, am I doing really well at work? Do I want to take on a part-time program? Do I want to take on a full-time program? Do I want to do an online program? There are a lot of options for you, right? And, and you know, I myself didn't want to lose my um, professional capital. So I chose to do my program full-time. <laughs> so full-time work and full-time school all of it through my master's program. And it kind of drove me a little crazy, but you know, I survived, but it was a decision that I made, right? The current situation, it was feasible for me and I was supported by USC. I had an incredible supervisor at that time that let me go and um, you know, take my classes and experience that. So the situation was something that was feasible for me. Finances, you know, that's obviously a huge question that we all, you know, go through. And, and this is something that can I, can I afford? Is there fellowships? Is there scholarships available? Um, is this something that I can apply for? What does that mean? Um, you know, it's different for master's programs. It's different for PhD programs. It's different for professional programs. Um, you know, those are all things that we have to consider as we go along and we, when we start to make these decisions about, you know, applying to graduate school. And, and I'll, I'll dive a little deeper into those topics within the next couple of slides. Um, desired, desired lifestyle and versus the type of program. So work-life balance, that's something that I, I just quickly just mentioned, but um, it's something to consider. There's a lot of options for you at the grad school level now. You know, part-time programs, flex programs. Um, you know, do I want to do a program that's a one-year? Do I want to do a two-year program? Do I want to do a three-year program? PhD programs are obviously four to five years. Um, you know, that's gonna that's gonna really alter the way of your lifestyle works, right? Do I want to? Do you have kids? Do you have a large family? Um, these are all things that we have all gone through as we make these decisions about graduate school, um, and and how we you know and, and how we want to decide if we want to do this or not, or the type program um, that we want to do. And one thing that I can tell you that all of us share is making the decision to go to grad school goes beyond just the university process, right? Um, for me, I am actually a first generation student. I'm from Boyle Heights, from the East LA area. Um, and it was something that I didn't have a lot of people in my family that went to a master's program or went to a PhD program. So I was all alone in that regard and, and how I wanted to make that decision and how that, you know, obviously affected me financially. Um, and, you know, it was something that I really had to, you know, look into some mentors to help me kind of decide that and, and, and my faculty members that can really kind of push me along the the right direction. So making the decision to go to grad school certainly is, goes beyond just a standard process. This is a personal decision. This is something that you know you definitely don't want to make uh, lightly. One of the things I do want to cover is understanding your degree type. And as I, you know, in my admissions career and as I've gone on as director, um, I've met thousands and thousands of people all across the country um, who are interested in grad school and, and, and it's great, but I really want to stress this enough. There's a lot of different types of programs, right? Um, and unfortunately, a lot of people don't really know the, the difference between them. So, you know, we have professional schools, we have traditional academic programs, but what does that mean? Right. And it's important that you do your research, you know, and we all know that master's programs are typically one to two years full time or part time, depending it might be three years. Um, you know, a lot of master's programs are going down the one year route, um, making it cheaper for you to actually complete it. Um, and, you know, but but understand that there's a difference in what that means. Right. What is a master of arts as opposed to a master of science or as opposed to a master of education or an MED, right, or an MBA or an MSW? There's a lot of variations out there and they're just growing and growing. So really understanding what that means, right? And one of the things I can tell you right now is that there is a huge difference between an academic program and a traditional, a traditional academic program and a professional program. So when you're looking at traditional academic programs, you're looking at your master of arts, you're looking at your PhD, right? You're looking at your BA as well. Those are traditional academic programs that are tied to maybe the academic senate at your university and to our, are tied to a prescribed, you know, um, schedule of courses and, and, and variations that you have to take. Um, you know, professional schools, that includes dental school, right? That includes medical school, that includes social work, law, business, you know, those degree types are very different, right? They may be more flexible in what you can complete. They may not have a thesis option. Um, you know, they may not include research in that. So it's really in, in 
you know, uh, important that you follow up with the type of program that you're, that you're interested in and really what that entails, right? Professional schools and professional programs don't really may not have that research perspective, um, you know, are, are, are mostly tied to professional outcomes, right? Like an MBA, a business administration program or a law program. Um, so really understanding what that means, what that entails as far as the application process um, and what that also entails as far as what you will go through throughout the program, right? We know that PhD programs are, are longer and they require a full amount of research and partnerships with faculty. Professional programs may not require that, right? Or some might actually have a hybrid and might offer some research programs or some research options um, that you can continue. But there is a lot of fluctuation. There is a lot, a ton of programs available for you that all require a varying amount um, of, of processes and you just have to make sure you stay on top of it. So, but I think this will kind of give you an idea of, of what those degree options are, are, are like um, and, and you know, making sure that you understand that there is a difference between professional schools and those traditional academic programs. Um, what graduate admissions? And yes, the process is different <laughs> for masters and doctoral students. Um, you, um, you, you really have to do your research. Um, and I know that's kind of a, a basic thing to say, but it really is about research and really understanding what that involves of you. Um, you know, each university is different. Each university has a certain level of requirements and, and re require different things for their application. And um, some might be more flexible, others might not. So you really want to make sure you do your research for every single master's program and every single doctoral program that you want to apply to. Um, you know, admission tests are out there. There's a variety of them. There is a GMAT. There is a GRE. Um, there is, um, you know, the law school test, the LSAT. There's a lot of different tests out there that, that you would have to take and um, understand those. Understand that, you know, they have re different requirements in what they're testing. Understand that, um, you know, the, the timeline for taking them um, and, you know, actually receive your scoring, that might also be different. So all of that takes time and you really want to make sure that you're building a timeline for yourself um, and understanding what that entails. You know, um, graduate admission is also about your undergraduate transcripts, um, all undergraduate transcripts, making sure that you require that you actually receive your transcripts from all your undergraduate institutions, um, that they are official copies of it, um, and that you can upload those and have those ready. Um, the program application is, I wouldn't say it's fairly standard across all grad programs, but it might be kind of similar, right? They all require that statement of purpose. They all require the letters of rec, your resume or your CV. Um, you know, all of those things are kind of standard across the board. But when it comes to something that's different is your writing sample. So your writing sample is something that you definitely want to get a head start in um, early on in the process. Um, you know, a diversity statement, that's something that you may also be asked to include in your PhD application or any doctoral program. Um, those are things that you want to make sure that you can get started early on um, so that you can develop a quality, uh, you know, sample and a quality piece, um, you know, for a statement of purpose or, or whatever it may be. Um, I've also been part of graduate admissions processes that require a writing sample. So depending on how far out you are from your undergraduate experience, um, I've had, you know, writing samples that are required. So, you know, this may be a, a term paper or they might limit you and say there is only five to 10 pages of your paper that you should be submitting. So if you are a recent grad, that's great. You have some papers and some, you know, um, essays that you might be able to use that as a writing example. Um, if you're far removed from your undergrad institution, it's not the end of the world. Um, and they're requiring a writing sample, you may be able to use, um, you know, uh, writing samples from work, um, writing samples from, um, you know, your, your professional life that you can possibly include um, in there. Um, and then the uh, understanding that um, admission deadlines, interview deadlines, events, um, all of those are critically important. Um, scholarship deadlines, uh, you know, some programs are rolling admissions, some you can only apply for a certain semester, or you can only begin in the fall. Um, understanding all of that and the universities are, are different in, in how they manage that. So, you know, that's something that is, is critical um, depending on the school that you want to go to. Some universities are flexible with it. Um, some might ask, let you um, update your admission or defer your admission. Others might not let you do that. So um, it's critical that you have an understanding depending on which university you want to apply to um, before you 
submit your application. Um, understanding structures. So I mentioned early um, in my, in, in when we started talking in, in these lecture slides that um, there is a difference between professional programs and tra traditional academic programs. Um, and that also has a lot to do with faculty. So faculty are critically, critically important in the graduate admissions process. Um, and the reason why is because decisions are usually tied to faculty review. Um, I have not worked at one university that where that's the case. Um, so that's something that you really have to understand that, right? And because faculty are so closely tied to that process, um, that means that there are some things that you should be doing, right? And some tips and suggestions that we can give you. Number one is to start building rapport with faculty. So if you're interested in a particular program, and Gabby may be able to speak this, you know, in her PhD program experience um, when she applied, um, I'm sure she contacted a lot of faculty you know, as, as she was thinking about, uh, you know, uh, applying to this program, right? Because a lot of the faculty members are tied to that research experience. A lot of faculty members are tied to funding and fellowship and financial aid. Um, so reaching out to these faculty members is critical, right? You wanna express your interest. You wanna visit the campus. Maybe you can meet with them in person. Maybe you can set up an appointment to talk about um, what the program can do for you and why that program might be a good fit. Um, so, so reaching out to faculty is critically important. Um, in my own process, when I um, applied, when I was at UCSB and I was working there, I, I was looking at a lot of different grad schools. Um, and I chose USC because of the faculty, because they had a stellar education faculty, higher education faculty, and I wanted to learn from them. They were the people that I wanted to, look, to learn from, and they were pillars of the profession, and their, were, their research and their experience was cited everywhere that you can you know, possibly see, and to me, that was exciting, right? So when I got into all of my schools, I, I really wanted to go to USC because of that reason. Um, because faculty members are, you know, those faculty members were, I knew were going to give me what I wanted as far as my um, educational experience. Um, so I reached out to them, you know, early on in the beginning and, and I visited and I met with them and I asked them about their research. I asked them about what they teach. I asked them all of those type of questions that I knew would help me build some rapport with them for when I applied. Now, this is something that is not required, but it can certainly help you, right? Um, and, you know, depending again on the type of program that you're applying, is it a professional program or is it a traditional academic program? Some faculty members might also be very receptive to that. Others might not. So, um, you know, they might never reply to your email, so don't get hurt. <laughs> They're just really busy people. And um, so, and Gabby can certainly speak to that, um, you know, as we, uh, as we move on. Um, some quick tips that we can give you that will hopefully stir up some questions from all of you is number one, update your resume. Have everything actually updated now. So if you're thinking about, you know, applying to grad school, this is something that's critical, right? It's going to be kind of a quick process as a turnaround when you're thinking about which programs to apply to. And you want to make sure you have everything ready. So your resume, your CV, all of those things are take time to update, right? And you, you want to make sure they're updated, they look clean, they look professional. Um, again, I mentioned the diversity statement. Some universities require it, others don't, but just be ready, right? Uh, to have that diversity statement, to have your statement of purpose. Um, maybe you want to have one that's a general statement of purpose. Um, you know, um, some other universities actually require you to answer specific questions so that, you know, you have to be ready for that. You might think that your, your statement of purpose could be used for other universities, but you might not, that might not be the case, right? So the questions might be different. And you want to have all of those ready to deploy, especially if you're reaching out to faculty members, right? Or if you're reaching out to a staff member saying that you want to come visit and you want to meet them, you want to make sure that you have those ready so that you can send them. Um, and you may even may even be able to ask them for feedback, right? So what do you think about, you know, my statement? And, you know, can you give me some feedback? Can you give me some advice? Um, and just having those ready will really make your life much easier as you start moving forward down the line if you want to apply or not. Um, gather copies of your official transcripts early. I know um, it's kind of silly, but, you know, as a director of admission, I cannot stress that enough. Um, you know, so many people that actually submit their uh, uh, documents late. And by doing, submit, by submitting things late, you're, you're, um, the process is going slower for you. Right. So um, faculty members are already reading applications or moving down the line. Um, they're doing all of that. 
Um, so it, it's, it's critical that, you know, you, you submit those early and you get them so that you can be read early so that faculty members can see your file and can make a decision that the earlier, you know, the more financial aid <laughs> you can get funding. All of that is critically important. Um, another quick tip, reach out to faculty of interest. So I mentioned that attend information sessions and events, um, you know, as the director of admission now, we have tons of events throughout. Um, you know, the fall or the spring um, for both prospective students and, you know, admitted students attend one of them. Ask, can I go to this event? Can you meet faculty? This is another way to get your, your name out there and establish rapport. Um, and, you know, sometimes it is kind of annoying to get a ton of emails from universities and, and, and doing all of that, but this will help you, right? You're building your network and you're building your faculty connection because they will be there. So I think attending, you know, those info sessions and events are critically important. And I mentioned to you, and I cannot stress this enough, to apply as early as possible. So funding does run out, especially at highly selective institutions. And I can tell you that from firsthand experience, um, you have to apply as early as possible, which is why you have to have everything updated, which is why you have to have your statement of purpose done, everything, um, so that you can submit it within the first round. Um, because you will be left behind when it comes to fellowships. Um, and you have to really understand that universities award fellowships differently. So, um, you know, highly selective institutions might actually have fellowship amounts that are cover entire tuition or that cover half a year or one full year, whatever it may be, but those will go out early. So you really want to make sure that you can get your name out there and you can get your application in there so that you can be considered for those high um, you know, uh, scholarship amounts and high fellowship amounts, um, and especially for those highly selective institutions. Um, so I think for that, for now, those um, topics really um, cover kind of the gamut of what we want to do um, and, um, and what kind of where we want to lead you to. Um, but in order to expand on our conversation on continuing your education, I last asked, I'd like to ask Gina and Gabby a few questions about their advanced degree experience, advice they have for those considering um, a return to school and thoughts on how um, various programs can help with career progression. Uh, the three of us have very diverse, different experiences, so I'd definitely like to hear from them. Um, and then following these questions uh, that I'm going to provide them, we will open things up for audience to address your questions. So please, as a reminder, you can submit your questions at any time by clicking on the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. So the first question that I want to ask is um, regarding your journey. So um, if you can please share a little bit about your background, the discipline you studied in graduate school, and your current role. So why don't we start with Gina? Hi, Fernando. Um, so I am a first-generation student. Um, I was also a transfer student. I graduated from UC Davis in 2002 with a degree in international relations and Italian. Uh, after I graduated, I spent about a year kind of unsure about what that would do for me exactly, what I wanted to do, what kind of jobs I wanted to have, or that would even, there would be a potential for. So I decided on grad school to continue studying Italian. I went to NYU and got my master's in Italian studies. And then after I finished grad school, I made a pretty significant pivot and went and took a job at a sales and marketing firm in New York City and got my start in marketing, which is what I'm still doing today. After about eight years in real estate, I switched to uh, higher ed and back at UC Davis as the strategy manager for our continuing and professional education division. Gabby, you wanna share? Yes, thanks, Fernando. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Gabby Monsalve. I, um, just as a little background for me, I did my undergraduate at the University of Minnesota. I graduated in 2005 with a degree in biochemistry. Um, and afterwards, I decided that I needed a break from studying. And so I worked at a university as a technician in a laboratory at UCSD for two years before deciding to make the switch and go to grad school. So I did my PhD at UCLA um, in biological chemistry and graduated in 2012 and then came up to UCSF for my postdoc and did an, an additional three years of training in molecular biology before I did a complete career shift and moved into a career um, and professional development for biomedical scientists, graduate students and postdocs. 
Um, and so now I'm working in higher ed in an administrative role rather than working at the bench as in the way that I was trained. Well, that's great. And I, I thank you too for sharing that. And, um, you know, I shared, you know, part of my experience, I, I had an incredible experience as UC, at UCSB um, when it came to student affairs um, and, and just the student experience overall. And I just fell in love with it. And I realized that I wanted to work with students and that I was good at it and that I wanted to help people find their fit. Um, and which is, which is why I went into admissions. And for me, it just kind of spiraled into where I'm at now and um, I've been doing this now for 10 years so <laughs> um, but let's move on I really do want to uh, you know this talk about this idea of lessons learned so you know how did you determine that graduate school was right for you right and we all have that moment when we pivot and when we think that this is what I want to do right and I kind of mentioned to you why it is that I, I went that route but I want to learn about you guys. Like, how did you determine that graduate school was right for you? And, um, you know, and how did you select your graduate discipline and program? And Gabby, obviously, you know, you did your PhD and you went towards the sciences. So I think that's something that I, I would love for you to share and how you actually selected your graduate discipline and program. Yeah, it, that's a great, that's a great question, Fernando. And um, as I think back to 2005 and 2007, I think, you know, I had spent, um, a number of years studying biochemistry. I liked it. I kind of just accidentally fell into that degree program as an undergraduate. Um, and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I worked as a tech in a lab. Um, and I, I wasn't so much enamored with the bench science as much as I was really enamored with being on the forefront of knowledge. Um, and that was, that was an addiction that I really couldn't quite, you know, it was something where I thought, you know, what if I could make a career out of this? What if I could continue to really think deeply about questions? Um, and so I did um, something that we promote quite a bit, which is a lot of informational interviews, talking with graduate students, talking with postdocs, talking with faculty, to really get a sense of what it would be like as a graduate student. And so by, at the point where I decided that it, a PhD was right for me, I had learned two things about myself. One, was that I really did want to become faculty. That was, that was a primary career goal for myself. Um, and the other thing that I learned about myself is that I really liked working in a university environment. Um, so no matter what I did, whether it was faculty or not, I, I liked the idea of having and building a career within an educational setting. Um, and to do that, and to do that in a way that I could um, be in a leadership position, I was going to need a PhD. Um, and so I think um, through the process of doing informational interviews and really being honest with myself, um, I went into grad school, I think, really knowing why I was there. And it was to get that degree to give me the credentials to move on to where I thought I was heading. Great. Gina, would you like to share? Sure. Um, so as an undergrad, I studied abroad in Italy and really loved my Italian coursework. So the decision to go to graduate school was really about diving deeper into something that I was passionate about, that after I spent about a year um, out of school, realized that I was really missing. Um, and it's something that I really had a lot of curiosity around and wanted to get into more. So I, I had taken an Italian cinema course as an undergrad, and that was really one of those defining and impactful courses for me. But once I knew I wanted to go on to grad school, I really consulted quite a bit with my professors back in the Italian department at UC Davis. I shared my goals and my interests uh, with them, and they were really helpful in guiding me uh, to a program that fit my interests, specifically around Italian film. Um, so not every Italian program um, was well suited for me. So they helped me narrow that and navigate the process a lot. And in the end, um, I, I switched over to NYU. Great, thank you for sharing that. Um, I, we're gonna move on to targeted questions in a bit, but I do wanna share one that we just got that Gabby kind of answered and um, both of you actually kind of alluded to and Lily asked us, there are so many different graduate programs, do you have any suggestions for picking what you want to study? Um, and Gabby brought up a great point about informational interviews. And I think that's a perfect way to do that, right? So, and you, you mix informational interviews with a little bit of LinkedIn stalking um, and, um, and see what people do and, and really see what they do, see how they got there, 
um, and, and ask them, can I have coffee with you? Obviously if they're local or if you can do, you know, a Skype session or whatever, I think that's certainly appropriate, right? Um, especially as you see alumni, uh, we can certainly reach out to each other and say, hey, I noticed that you did this degree program and you did this and you have, and I've had people tell me, I, I wanna go into higher ed, can I, ch can I chat with you? And the, 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 the answer is yes. So I think that's a perfect way for you to, um, you know, to, to do some informational interviews and, and figure out, and to, to learn more about programs and, and, and what you wanna do. So informational interviews and LinkedIn stalking. But my next question <laughs> to you all um, is, you know, some pros and cons. So um, Gabby, we often hear, you know, the positive aspects of returning to school as a way to propel your career forward. Um, and, you know, do you think there are any potential drawbacks or things you wish you would have known before committing to graduate school? And obviously, you know, again, with this notion that the PhD is like four to five years or six years or whatever, however long it took you, um, you know, potential drawbacks or things you, things you, would have, you wish you would have known before committing to graduate, for graduate school? And what advice can you offer those who are currently weighing the pros and cons of continuing their education? Yeah, that's a great question, Fernando. And I guess um, there's, there's a couple of major parts to it. Um, the first thing that I would say is that um, before you make a decision about whether graduate school is right for you, you need to be honest with yourself. This isn't a decision that you take lightly it is a major lifestyle change. Um, and I can't emphasize that enough, at least for my doctoral program. Um, my doctoral program had a median time to degree of six years. I finished in five and a half, so right on time. Um, and my working hours were regularly 10 hour days. Um, I would have days where I would be working in the laboratory 48 hours straight. Um, it affected my health. Um, it affected um, what I consider to be work-life balance, but it was what was required for the research to get done. Um, and so um, that being said, I don't regret it at all, but it was a lot of work and it was a full-time thing. Um, the other thing that I'll tell you is that um, with regards to doctoral programs and academic ones, PhDs in particular, um, there is a cost-benefit analysis that you have to make. Um, you know, you're taking a hit in the in your potential lifetime earnings by going to grad school. In my case, um, I I was in the biological sciences, so the the standard is that you get a stipend and that your tuition is covered for. That's not necessarily true for other doctoral programs. What that meant was is that I was taking a large pay cut during, you know, my, my 20s when I could be actually using that time in another setting to be increasing my lifetime earnings. Um, for me, it was worth it because I really did want to get that PhD because I had a focus on where I wanted to land after I finished my training. Um, but there were definitely classmates that I had that they didn't have that focus or they kind of went into grad school thinking, I really like science and I really like biology, so I'll just keep doing the same thing. Um, and I noticed that they struggled quite a bit. Um, the other part about my doctoral program that I wish I'd known, I kind of knew a little bit, but I didn't really appreciate, it is how unstructured it is and how different that feels from an undergraduate program. So um, in undergraduate, you have a series of courses, you have grades, you have evaluations, you get into a PhD and it's all gone. They pretty much just say, we anticipate that you have a thesis that you come up with an interesting question that you publish some books or some articles, get them peer reviewed, create some new knowledge. We're not gonna give you a whole lot of structure, good luck. Um, and going from a mindset of, you know, being a really good student and getting A's and, you know, just kind of studying for exams and then just being in something that was completely unstructured and being just being told to figure it out and that was the norm was different. Um, and some people adapted better to that than others. So that would be the one thing that I wish I had known. Um, so do you need that degree? Do you want that degree? Um, have you done the cost benefit analysis of what it's going to take? and what you're gonna to have to do in terms of your finances as, as well as your personal life. And before I move into Gina for our final question, I do wanna uh, ask one of the other, well, uh, tackle one of the questions from one of the audience members. It's kind of closely related to what you mentioned, Gabby, um, you know, about balancing the goal of grad school with your professional career, whether you go to grad school part-time or full-time, it comes from Michelle. And, you know, it's something that I alluded to earlier too of my own experience. Like I, 
you know, I was not going to give up my professional capital and my, you know, work life or my work earnings for the future. I just refused to do that. Right. So I decided to go crazy. <laughs> and I did my program um, full time. So I was taking classes, three, three classes a week, right at the grad level, which is a lot. Um, I had, I had work from eight to four, class from four to seven, and then class from seven to 10. And then I still had to go home and read and do all of that for my next class the following day. I was still senior assistant director of admissions. So I was traveling all over the world recruiting and I was reading on planes. I was reading all over the place, all over the world. So yeah, so that's something that you know that's a sacrifice that you have to make and you're absolutely right it's something that you have to really ask yourself you know is this something that's worth it for you and is it something that you can balance at this point in your life but Gina I, I want to ask you um, you know about you know continuing education so in you know how do you think that continuing education or extension programs um, help candidates advance their careers Yes, quite differently probably from Gabby's perspective, but um, certainly continuing education extension programs uh, have a very distinct place for specific people. It's becoming clear that continuing ed programs are really no longer um, an option. They become mandatory as people generally work longer in their careers and industries and technologies evolve really rapidly. And so the skills um, needed to remain relevant shift as well in somebody's career. So certificate programs can be a really good solution for people who want to train up at the pace of the industry in their industry shifts. Continuing it offers constant, pretty consistent and convenient opportunities to allow people to upskill, reskill and reinvent their careers. This can perhaps be more easily done while you keep your full time job and manage a really full schedule in life. Certificate programs are often scheduled to, to suit a full time working schedule. They might be online. They offer flexible schedules. They might be hybrid formats between classroom and online. Um, and so I think that's sort of, you just have to assess what place in your life and your career are you? Um, do you want to put those things on hold and go to graduate school? Or do you want to sort of maintain your life and your career and sort of um, incorporate education into it? A certificate program might be more easily suited to do that. A lot of certificate programs offer academic credit, so that might not that might be all you need to achieve your career goals at that time. That might be something that your employer will also value in assessing promotion opportunities for you. The program might fulfill educational requirements for certain certifications you might need in your position or in the position you're aiming to get into. So have those conversations with your employer and make sure that your goals align with opportunities within your organization. Um, and lastly, I would say that continuing Continuing ed courses are generally taught by professionals working in the field, which brings some really unique values. You can learn practical skills that can be applied immediately on the job. Um, and then there's really unique networking possibilities with instructors and peers. You have the opportunity to expand your network. A lot like what everybody's doing right now, what you mentioned, LinkedIn stalking and, and um, networking with your alumni association. This is really another outlet for that in sort of assessing what are my career opportunities? Um, will I learn the things that I need to learn to get into that position I really want? No, thank you for sharing that. And, um, you know, certificate options are really a viable option now. You know, you don't have to do the full master's program, um, you know, or doctoral program or whatever it may be. And a lot of universities offer them now. Some just, just keep, keep in mind that uh, requirements are different for each one. Um, but to your point, too, about, you know, they actually might count for credit. That's something that we do here um, at Claremont. So if you start a certificate program and then later on to say, you know what, I want to go for the full-on master's program, that's something that you can transition easily, as opposed to other universities who might not be able to do that. So it's giving you that taste before you actually decide um, to go on for the full-on um, program. So now let's move on to the fun part. Um, we have a quite a lot of answer questions from folks. Um, so I wanna make sure that we get um, to as many as we possibly can. Um, so let me see here. Um, so Edwin, um, Edwin's asking, and Gabby, this might be something that you can cover. What are your chances of getting into a PhD program without a master's degree? Um, so Edwin, it's going to depend on your, uh, your discipline. 
So for uh, the STEM fields, physics, I, I can speak to physics, chemistry, biology, um, maybe not social sciences, but certainly among those, um, you don't need a, master, a master's. Um, so I went right from bachelor to PhD, and that's pretty typical. Um, where we would, where I would see, at least for those uh, disciplines where I would see masters uh, more frequently is among our international scholars. So people who are coming overseas and had already done a master's um, as part of their preparation for a PhD in the United States. Great, thank you. Um, Raul asked a, a question that, um, that I can cover slightly and if you two want to jump in by all means please do. Um, you know, he asked what action plan would you recommend for someone that is very passionate about their field of work and would like to study with the professors who are very well known in that field, but the GPA attained during that undergraduate school is between a 2.5 or a 2.9. Um, you know, Raul, this is something that's not, um, that's very common. <laughs> so I wouldn't, you know, freak out about that. Um, you know, you, I, I, and this is why, again, building, you know, rapport with faculty members is essential, right? Because they are in the faculty admissions committee. They are part of that review committee, um, you know, and, and can certainly point you in the right direction. I would certainly obviously still apply. Um, different universities have different, you know, ways in how they review applications, right? So a lot of them are very comprehensive. Um, they, you know, look at every aspect of your application as opposed to just your GPA. Um, so I wouldn't really worry about that. Um, you know, there's also, you know, depending on how they calculate GPA, if they're calculating GPA differently, um, a lot of them use the last two years of your university coursework, your upper division coursework to calculate GPAs. And I can tell you too, from my own experience at UCSB, my GPA wasn't really that high. Um, you know, incredibly high. Um, but what I did is when I applied, I actually calculated my graduate, uh, my upper division GPA, and that was what I included in my application, right? So I included my cumulative GPA, which is okay. Uh, it was not great. Um, but then I also included my major GPA, right? And I, and I put all of those and I made sure to include those in my statement of purpose as well, just to let them know that this is you know, you can see that my major coursework is my strong suit, right? Because this is my major, this is what I'm passionate about, this is what I, I, what I, what I like, um, as opposed to take my, you know, cumulative GPA, which was taking these random courses that I probably didn't even like or enjoy. So hopefully that answers your question. And if any of you two want to chime in, please let me know. Um, I'll just add that um, I'll echo Fernando, get to know the faculty that you're interested in working in. In biology, I knew a number of people who did not have stellar GPAs, even if they had cut it, you know, with their major versus their cumulative, it still wasn't going to cut it for them. But they were able to work in a lab for, you know, one to two years, sometimes three years, build rapport, build a professional network, and get a really strong letter of recommendation from a faculty mentor that got them into graduate school. You might also look to see if um, your school offers some type of access programs or open campus solutions that you might take a certain class or two that will help boost your GPA, particularly in the area that's important. Um, that might be another option if you have the time to do that. Absolutely. Kylie asked, um, were any of your decisions for graduate school similar to your undergraduate school decisions? For example, campus environment, program in question, curriculum, finances, et cetera. And do your prior work experience help you narrow down what specific concentration you want to pursue and the purpose for doing so? So Kylie, absolutely yes, I think so. Um, you know, and for me and in, in, in how you go about this and how I advise people, you know, again, this is, I started with faculty. So I looked at the faculty list and I said, these are the people that I want to learn about, you know, higher education. And my master's is in post-secondary administration and student affairs. So I wanted to learn from these faculty members. I applied to other universities across the country. Um, you know, and yes, while USC was in my backyard, I, I felt the most comfortable there, right? Because I knew that the faculty were going to be supportive and, you know, they were going to be there for me and the campus was great and the program and it was cohorted. So that's something that is essential to, and, and, and you two can certainly share into that. Um, the cohort was important, right? The cohort size was about 22, I want to say. So we were actually really, you know, kind of close in that regard, and you all moved together. 
as a cohort and experienced a program together. So there's some camaraderie aspects to it. Um, so all of those things really came into to play for me. I also, obviously, and then I actually got into USC before I started working. So after I started working full time is when I can, you know, take care of that benefit, the employee benefit, but I made the decision to go there before even that happened. Um, but my experience was great and it was all because all of those things just kind of came together. Um, if I can just chime in, I was trying to decide between going to do my PhD at UCSD versus UCLA. Um, and one of the things that went into my calculation um, I had worked at UCSD as a tech for two years. Um, I knew the area. I was really comfortable with it. And they did some awesome things like give me more financial aid than UCLA did. But I, for me, it was really important to have some sort of lifestyle balance. And I thought I would be able to achieve that in LA versus in San Diego. Um, and that was based off of the information that I, did, that I received from other graduate students that say, you know, told me, you know, this is a major lifestyle change, so make sure that you have fun things to do and things that are going to work um, for you so that you can get out of the lab every once in a while. And so honestly, that's why I chose UCLA was that that environment just felt better for me. Um, and even though UCSD was on paper the easier choice, that's why I went to UCLA. Uh, Ruby is asking us, hello, is it possible to in enter into a management director role without obtaining a graduate degree? Is experience in working not enough? What do you guys think? I think it depends on where you're working. I think that's a big factor. I think the answer is yes, it can be. Um, if you're working in academia, it's probably not as likely. Um, but if you're working in some industries, I think definitely, yes, some people really value the MBA, the terminal degrees, um, but um, certainly uh, I don't think that's a hard and fast rule. I think you need to kind of know um, what career you really want, what industry are you working on, and that might not be uh, true for everything. So there's a lot of opportunities to really upskill in leadership specific topics that uh, your employer might value. And I think that you can obtain a leadership role without a graduate degree, but um, you really sort of have to show that you uh, have mastered some skills around some certain topics. And I think it will take some training. There has to be some commitment to understanding uh, leadership skills, leadership uh, philosophy. Um, but it's my, my uh, insight is that it's not a hard and fast rule that you need a graduate degree. I agree. I think that for in academia it might be different, right? If you want to move up, you know, you know, the management line and, you know, people have PhDs and people have doctoral degrees and, you know, they go do all of that. Um, but it is not a hard, fast rule that you have to have this and it depends on the industry. So this is why LinkedIn stalking is critical, right? <laughs> uh, you go and you see who has those, ro those roles and those jobs and these are great questions that you can certainly ask them. Um, Christine asked, how is the sense of community for grad school students? What did you do to seek out those communities? Um, and I could take the first part of this because I kind of mentioned the cohort, um, you know, idea. For me, it was, it was great, right? And I'm actually from LA. Like I mentioned, I'm from East LA Boyle Heights. So I felt just different having, knowing that my network and my friends are in LA. So I didn't really need to, the need to build something brand new, but others do, right? Uh, people that are coming from all over the country to start these programs. Um, and th that's kind of what I liked about the cohort model, right? Because every, and even though I couldn't participate in any fun because I didn't have any time for to do that, because <laughs> um, I had all of my classes and, you know, I had work, um, you know, they would always go to happy hour after, you know, class, or they would do that and or go have dinner after class. And I participated in some, but it was the, just having the ability to do so with people in your cohort is great. Um, so, and the university offers a lot of different resources for graduate students as well. So I don't know if your experience is similar, Gina or Gabby. My experience was similar in grad school. The, we came in as a co cohort um, in an umbrella program. Um, and uh, my class size for that cohort was 54 that year. It was quite large. Um, so we, you know, made very, very strong friendships. I actually met my spouse that way too, believe it or not. Um, so, so it was great. Um, the community was a huge component of my graduate school experience. 
same. I, I think that you spend so much time together and you have such similar paths. Um, my program was really small too. I, I have um, longer lasting relationships with the people that I was in grad school with than I do with people um, that I knew as undergrads. And I spent more time with people um, in my undergrad life than I did in grad school. It was a shorter program, but um, I'd say, yes, the community is strong which I think makes it easier to survive all of the all Absolutely. long hours. Um, so Claire is asking us, is it true that standardized testing requirements, you know, for example, GRE scores are being less and less common? Um, Claire, it depends on um, the university. Some, you know, graduate programs are, are getting rid of the GRE or they're not using it as a high value in their program. There are PhD programs that are doing that as well. Um, you know, but, you know, but still there are a lot of institutions that still use that as a value for determining funding. So it just kind of depends. You just want to make sure that you have all your T's crossed and I's dotted and you do the best that you can possibly can. Um, and again, build, uh, with this notion of, you know, speaking to faculty and building rapport with them and asking them, you know, how the GRE, does it play a huge role in funding distribution? Does it play a huge role in the admissions process? These are all questions that are certainly great for when you start talking to faculty members. Um, Natalie is asking us, how long is too long after having graduated in order to be able to use a piece of your academic writing as a writing sample? So Natalie, um, you, there's no right answer to this, um, you know, and again, this is a question that I, I, I keep saying faculty, but this might be great, right, <laughs> to ask a faculty member to say, hey, is my, um, and don't say it like that, hey, but is, you know, my writing sample something that, you know, is, you know, is strong? Is this a strong piece that I could submit to the admissions committee? Um, and they should be able to certainly give you some feedback or if it's something that, you know, if it's too long, um, if you're, let's say, 10 years out of, under, of undergrad, then it might be a little too long for that piece. It's no longer relevant. Then maybe you can write something new, right, um, and, and propose that. And that might be a question that can also go to faculty as well. Can I, can I write something new um, to, to submit to the admissions committee? Um, Farnaz is asking us, and Gabby, this is a great, great, great question for you. Do all PhD programs require the student to be a TA um, or teacher's assistant? Um, it's a great question. The answer is no. Um, at UCLA, it was required um, as, part of our, as part of our curriculum that we get teaching experience. Um, at UCSF, it's not required um, because we don't have undergraduates here. Um, so it just depends on the institution. Um, some graduate programs, if you bring in your own money, you're not required to teach. Some of them, regardless of your funding source, you're required to teach. So it just depends. Okay. Um, we're just getting so many. <laughs> it was like, how do we answer all of these questions? Um, What do you recommend to look into applying to a program in a field I didn't study in undergrad and have never worked in, but recently started studying? Um, I, I think, you know, to the point we were making earlier about informational interviews, I think that's something that's great for that, um, you know, and, to, and feel free to jump in, Gabby or Gina, but I think, you know, um, this is an opportunity, you know, if it's far removed, some programs actually do have prerequisites, like if you're thinking about science programs and, you know, um, the hard sciences, they may have requirements for you to complete, obviously, like medical school and, you know, you, you might have to do pre-med or those type of coursework courses, um, you know, but obviously people apply to all different types of programs in the humanities and you don't have humanities experience or history or those types of experience as well so you just have to be able to um, express your passion for it right and what you want to do and how this is going to change you and um, so I think I think that's certainly you know something that that's good Gabby and Gina I don't know if you want to share um, so we only have a few minutes so um, let me find We've tackled a lot of these issues. So Justin asked, you mentioned that some institutions have rolling admissions. So when exactly is considered early in the admissions process? I think that's a great question. Um, you know, a lot of universities have different deadlines. Um, and you really, I always tell students, you want to work your way backwards. 
right? So um, if the deadline, if their first priority deadline may be, you know, December, um, you know, pick your last time that you're going to take, schedule your GRE test if you have to take the GRE, right? So maybe the early December, the first week of December is the last time you're going to take the GRE. You know, from that, then you start building out when you're going to submit your application, when you're going to do, um, you know, all of that and how you're going to start submitting all of your documents. Um, so it just kind of depends on the university too. If they have different deadlines, then you have to follow that um, as well. But I would honestly, and I always advise students, work your way backwards, um, you know, and, and look at deadlines and see how you can start building and structuring your timeline for how you're going to submit um, your application and all the required materials. I think that certainly always helps. But since we are almost out of time, before we end our session today, I last ask each of our panelists to share at least one piece of feedback with our audience. Gina, maybe what's one thing that you really want our audience to walk away with today? Gabby, if you could do that as well. I, I, would, I would say my piece of advice is to just really understand your goal and your why. So why are you going back to school or why are you considering grad school or other educational opportunities? Uh, what is the outcome that you want out of that? Because if it's um, something that you, if it could be something that maybe you assumed I needed grad school um, in order to achieve, it might not be. So understand your goal and then do your research because there's a lot of options out there and um, I think I'll just echo a lot that what Fernando already said is, is utilize your network that you already have. Talk to your, in, your faculty and your professors, talk to your fellow students, your, your alumni association. There are really, really great resources available to you at your alumni association alone. And there might be discounts available to you for educational opportunities you didn't know about. If you are a UC employee, there's probably additional uh, educational reimbursement opportunities um, or discounts. So um, just spend some time and, and do your research. I have very little to add because that was a perfect answer, Gina. Um, and I will, I will just also, um, I guess the only thing that I would add is um, for, for PhD, this is, it's not, it may be an easy decision to go you know, for you to, to go through the process of, it, of it, you know, applying and getting in. But the PhD itself is a lot of work. It is a lifestyle change. Um, and be aware of that and acknowledge it. Acknowledge that it, it's going to be difficult for numerous reasons. But um, if you decide to go that route, there are a lot of really great benefits to it as well. But just don't go in blindsided. Go in knowing it's going to be a lot of work and that you have a goal in mind with it. Great, thank you. And I know we had tons of questions that we didn't get to, so please stalk me on LinkedIn and I will be more than happy um, to answer those for you. But on behalf of the University of California, thank you for joining us today for our UC Alumni Career Network webinar. It was certainly a pleasure to connect virtually with each of you today, and we appreciate you making time to be part of today's event and hope that you've gained valuable advice to help advance your career. So I really like to thank Gina and Gabby for their time, generosity and commitment to the University of California. Um, the insights and advice you each share today makes me especially proud to be a part of the UC community. It's something that's awesome and we are all here to help each other. I hope you will take a few minutes to provide feedback on today's event by following the survey gizmo link, which appeared when you launched today's webinar. Your feedback will certainly be used to help us determine topics for the next, for next future sessions and how we can certainly help each other. So we hope you will join us again on March 17th for our next UC Alumni Career Network webinar on career advancement. So tips for managing others. So it sounds like a great topic. So please join us for that. And please visit ucal.us backslash ACN for future details on upcoming webinars. So thank you all for joining us today. And we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>